Let's talk about the French pacifist who took the lives of 45,000 people, the man whose fame and life both met their end with the guillotine. Maximilien Robespierre coined the iconic slogan, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, only to later transform into a tyrant and dismiss everything he stood for. During his guillotining spree of 1793 and 1794, he beheaded an estimated 45,000 people. The event was later remembered as the Reign of Terror. Robespierre's uncompromising ideology, paired with his love for equality and freedom, led the revolutionary lawyer to push for King Louis XVI's execution. Drunk with power, Robespierre sought to massacre all French people who lacked the quote-unquote democratic virtue. In the end, it was he who lacked this virtue. Welcome to Uncharted History. Join us as we chart the gradual descent into madness of Maximilien Robespierre, the French Revolution's most controversial figure. Robespierre's childhood was marked by tragedy. Born on May 6, 1758 in Arras, he was the first son of Francois, a lawyer, and Jacqueline, a brewer's daughter, who married just five months before Max's birth. By the age of six, the family had grown to four children, and with his father struggling to find work and Jacqueline expecting their fifth child, challenges mounted. On July 16, 1764, after the stillbirth of a baby girl, Jacqueline passed away, profoundly affecting young Max. Just three years later, his father left, and the children were placed with family members. In 1766, at the age of eight, Maximilien Robespierre began his education at the College of Oratorians in Arras. In 1769, at 11, he received a scholarship to attend the prestigious college Louis Le Grand. Apart from forced religious studies, young Maximilien became enamored with the oratory skills of Cicero and Cato, as well as a dedicated student of the Roman Republic. In 1776, at the age of 17, he won the first prize in rhetoric. As the winner, Robespierre was chosen to deliver a speech before King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette. The young man spent days perfecting his diction and pronunciation, but instead of applause, he was brushed off by the king. He and the queen never got out of the carriage. This simple mistake would become the downfall of the French monarchy, as Robespierre would not easily forget a grudge. Enraged by the royal family's disregard for the people, Robespierre sought to transform France. From 1776 until his graduation in 1780, Robespierre immersed himself in the works of the most notorious Enlightenment author, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He eventually became a proponent of direct democracy, and championed the concept of natural rights for man. In July 1780, at the age of 22, Robespierre graduated from Louis Le Grand. He returned to Arras, established a private practice, and began changing the world, one poor person at a time. By 1786, after spending five years in the French justice courts and winning several oratory prizes, Robespierre was appalled by the inequality in the justice system. So what did he do? He took on controversial cases of poor people, allowing him to address pressing issues of his time, including the indignities faced by illegitimate children, the denouncement of lettres de cachet or imprisonment without trial, the marginalization of women in academia. During the second half of the 1780s, while Robespierre was building his political influence, King Louis XVI attempted to pass outrageous tax laws on the citizens. France's justice system was in shambles, and the royal coffers were practically empty. In August 1788, the King of France ordered a meeting on May 1, 1789, with the Estat General, a national assembly that had last convened in 1614, over 150 years prior. The Estat General would become Robespierre's key to true political power. This old-fashioned national assembly was comprised of three parts. The first estate, 303 representatives of the 100,000 Catholic clergy. The second estate, 282 deputies of the 400,000 French landowners. The third estate, 578 men representing 98% or 28 million French citizens. After securing a place in the Estat General on April 26, 1789, Robespierre arrived at Versailles and met the king on May 5, 1789. 
At Louis XVI's grand entrance, Robespierre and a few other deputies refused to bow. On June 6th, Robespierre delivered his maiden speech, attacking the hierarchy of the church and the excesses of the clergy. Just three days later, Robespierre and the Third Estate deputies formed the National Assembly, vowing to represent the interests of France's poorest 98%. Supported by the people, the National Assembly created a new constitution and tax code which was presented to the king on July 9, 1789. Louis XVI dismissed the popular finance minister Jacques Necker and rejected the document on July 11th. Riots broke out. Rumors began to spread that the French army would attack the people. The National Assembly proposed reinstating the bourgeois militia on July 13th to quell the unrest. One day later, France's monarchy would fall. After the French Revolution, France and the Western world would never be the same. On July 14, 1789, a fearful mob stormed the Hotel des Invalides, a veterans' hospital, from which they took 28,000 rifles requiring gunpowder. The mob stormed the Bastille, an unused Paris prison, and attacked the French army. After a short fight, the French army switched loyalties and joined what became known as the National Guard. Following months of fighting, on August 26, the National Assembly voted on the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen which later became France's new constitution. The king fled from Versailles, but the royal family was captured and transported to the Palace of the Tuileries, which became their temporary prison. One night in June 1791, after spending a year and a half in the palace, the king and queen disguised themselves as commoners and fled the Tuileries in a carriage. Yet again, they were caught. The following day, furious at Louis XVI, Robespierre vehemently attacked the king and queen in a speech, proclaiming them the deadliest enemies of the state. Robespierre would soon settle a grudge carried for 17 years. Despite being held prisoner, King Louis XVI commanded formidable power. In the fall, after the new constitution was created and Robespierre returned to his hometown, Louis XVI declared war on Austria. Maximilien was forced to speak out. The king had undermined the people's interests once again. Ultimately, when General Lafayette opened fire on protesters on June 20th, 1792, killing 1,000 people, it served as a pretext for dissolving the French monarchy. The king and queen were thrown in prison. The French Republic was declared on September 21st, 1792, and the king's support was doubtful. After discovering a secret stash of 726 documents containing conversations Louis XVI had had with bankers and ministers, on November 20th, 1792, all doubts were lifted. Robespierre delivered an impassioned speech before the assembly, declaring, Louis must die so that the nation may live. He was an official enemy of the Republic. At the start of the following year, on the morning of January 21st, 1793, King Louis XVI was driven up the scaffold, his hands tied with a handkerchief, and executioner Charles-Henri Sanson released the blade. After his head fell, people approached the guillotine to dip their handkerchiefs in the king's blood as a souvenir. Ten months later, Queen Marie Antoinette met the same fate on October 16, 1793. Robespierre's terror was just beginning. The reign of terror began a month before the Queen's beheading. Being a Montagnard, he went after the Girondins, the wealthy and well-to-do political opponents who advocated an expansive external policy. While the Girondins were preoccupied with conquering satellite states, the Montagnards, comprised of working-class citizens, seized administrative power in France. As the brain and mouthpiece of the French Revolution, Robespierre held ultimate power. Anyone who opposed the French Republic was considered an enemy of the people. What was the fate of national enemies? Execution. In 1793, Robespierre, aided by the Committee of Public Safety, reigned over the Seine region in Paris with dictatorial power. From September 5, 1793 until July 27, 1794, the Committee of Public Safety guillotined 16,600 enemies of the state, or roughly 50 people per day. Another 12,000 were guillotined without a trial, and approximately 10,000 people died in the prisons from overcrowding. 
this period would forever be remembered as the Reign of Terror. Its total death toll was 35,000 to 45,000 people. Quickly, Robespierre's popularity eroded. As the people rejected his rule, his political enemies accused the lawyer of orchestrating a coup d'etat using a falsified letter. The terrifying lawyer defended himself in a two-hour speech. However, the more he struggled to prove his innocence, the guiltier he seemed. Shortly after, he was arrested. Troops from the Paris Commune freed Robespierre, and he immediately sought refuge in Hôtel de Ville. The convention proclaimed Robespierre an outlaw, and what is the punishment for an outlaw? Death. As the convention forces drew near, Robespierre had tried to take his life. He placed a revolver in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Instead of his brains, Robespierre blew apart his jaw. When the troops arrived, they bandaged his shattered jaw and locked him in a cell. On July 28, 1794, Robespierre was walked up the guillotine. Massive crowds had formed at Place de la Concorde. He was carried to the pillory as the executioner locked his head. The man quickly ripped off the bandage. The dried blood tore pieces of flesh as it came off, forcing Robespierre to let out a ghastly scream. Shortly after, the cold blade of the guillotine silenced his shriek. Some say Robespierre was single-handedly responsible for establishing equality under the law. Others claim he is a tyrant who massacred innocent French revolutionaries. Either way, Lincoln was right when he said that, to test a man's true character, give him power. This is Uncharted History. See you in our next video.